Would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15? Mark chapter 15. And follow along with me or on the screen behind me. As we read his account of the passion and the cross of Christ. Beginning in verse 6. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Speaking to Pilate. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up, Jesus. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him out of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they let him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others? He cannot save himself? Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. We've been spending some time looking at Passion Week, Holy Week. The last week of our Lord's life on earth. On Holy Sunday, Jesus came into Jerusalem less than triumphantly in the triumphal entry, lowly and riding on a donkey's colt in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The 
The crowd shouted, welcomed him with joy, shouts of hallelujah to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And he goes straight to the temple. And he inspects the temple, his father's house, his own domain. Knowing just what had become of it over the centuries. He goes back to Bethany. And on Holy Tuesday, he goes back to Jerusalem in the morning. And he enters that temple again. And when he sees the rampant corruption and the money changing and the business and the commerce, in righteous indignation, he turns the tables over. And he indicts the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, you've turned my father's house of prayer and worship into a den of thieves. And he's outraged at what has become of what was to be his holy temple and the dwelling place of God. And the chief priests who had heard enough, who had long been waiting for the right time and just the right moment to seize him, to capture him, and to kill him out of envy and jealousy, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And the plot thickens. And they immediately make plans. And they make plans by way of a betrayer, a traitor among the twelve. On Holy Wednesday, Judas meets with the chief priests and for 30 pieces of silver agrees to tell them the location of Jesus when he's outside of the city, away from the adoring crowds, by cover of night where they could come and seize him quietly for 30 pieces of silver, also in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And on Holy Thursday, Jesus eats his last supper, which he transforms into the Lord's Supper, the Passover. And he inaugurates a new covenant in his blood, in his life, with the twelve. And during that same dinner, which is normally to be a celebratory occasion, full of joy, he says, one of you will betray me. After supper, they start walking to the Garden of Gethsemane late into Thursday evening and early Friday morning. And on the way there, he says, not only is one of you, my closest friends and companions, going to betray me again in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, but he says, you're all going to abandon me. You're all going to forsake me in the moment of my greatest need. And they all say no, especially Peter. Never, even if they all, I will never abandon you. I will go into the death with you, into the grave with you. I will die for you, Jesus. And they arrive at the garden where Jesus prays. And he asks the disciples to stay there with him. Peter, James, and John a little further to pray with him. And they can't. In the moment of his greatest need, Jesus is all alone, suffering, struggling, anticipating, anxiously, stressed, yes, even fearful in his humanity, his human nature, not his divine, so much so that he agonizes as he's praying and throwing himself prostrate on the ground before the Father, asking if this cup might pass from him, this cup of suffering, because he knows what's awaiting him, so much so that he begins to sweat great droplets of blood, Luke says. A real and very rare medical condition. That's how much the crushing weight of what was to come was bearing on his soul. He says, my soul is crushed to death. Pray with me, they can't. And John shares just some of what else Jesus was praying in that night in the garden. In John 17, prayed for unity in his church. 
prayed for protection over his disciples, prayed that they would abide and remain in the truth of God. His high priestly prayer. In the moment of his greatest need, not only did he pray for strength and resilience himself, for himself, but he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for his church, which he would inaugurate and build. And it's early Friday morning at this point. Holy Friday. Good Friday. And Judas arrives in the Garden of Gethsemane with the temple guards to seize Jesus. And they seize him. right? The one whom I kiss, here's the sign. And he greets him, Rabbi. And he kisses Jesus and immediately the temple guards seize him and arrest him. They begin punching and kicking him. And they drag him away to the high priest's house, the Sanhedrin, the council of 70, the ruling council of Jerusalem. And they drum up phony charges against him of blasphemy, of insurrection. Are you the son of God? And Jesus says, I am. And you'll see me sitting at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest is outraged. He tears his garment, a sign. That's what they would do when they, they'd heard a great blasphemy. He rips his garment. He says, this is enough. I've heard enough. And they blindfold him. And they begin to punch him and slap him. Prophesy, which one of us hits you? And they spit in his face. And then they finally drag him over to the Roman governor Pilate's headquarters. And they position the charges against Jesus in a way that forces Pilate to take them seriously. He says, hey, he's an insurrectionist. This is sedition. This is treason against Rome. He's claiming to be a king. We have no king but Caesar. He deserves death. And yet Pilate speaks to Jesus. He interrogates him. And after talking to him, he knows he's innocent. And he knows the religious leaders are just envious of him. And yet they sense that he's about to let Jesus go. And so what do they do? They begin to manipulate and sway the crowds. Give us Barabbas instead of Jesus. Barabbas, Barabbas. And Pilate finally relents. He said, what do you want me to do with this Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Crucify him. And so he agrees. But he knows Jesus is innocent. And he will not have innocent blood on his hands. And so he brings a bowl of water symbolically and washes his hands clean and says, his blood is on your hands. And what do the people scream? What do the religious Leaders scream, his blood is on us and on our children and on our children's children. But before this brutal execution by the cross, Pilate orders his guards to scourge Jesus. And so they tie his hands above his head, they strip him down to his undergarments, and two burly Roman Killer soldiers stand opposite each other on his sides. And they begin to strike him with a whip that had sharp lead and metal and bone attached to it by small leather cords like spikes again and again and again. All across his back. All across his legs. Front, back, doesn't matter. Wherever they can hit, wherever they can connect. But especially on his back. Until all the skin and the muscles are so shredded that his back looked like a mangled mess of blood and tissue and bone. Not unlike the depiction that some of us recently have seen in the Passion of the Christ on Wednesday. A very accurate and hard to watch. And the scourging took place publicly. 
in front of the governor's residence for maximum humiliation and degradation so all could see Jesus, this pathetic, self-professed king, be put to public shame. And then the soldiers, they fashioned a crown by weaving together thorns to mimic the laurel wreath that was used to celebrate conquering heroes and victorious athletes and honored citizens in a triumph. And they take this crown of thorns and they place it on his head and they press it into his scalp. One inch spikes. The scalp is the most vascular area of the body. And that results in copious bleeding. When Jesus has already been bleeding out from being scourged half to death with lacerations 12 to 14 inches all across his back and stomach an inch and a half deep. And then they put a reed or a staff in his right hand, like a scepter. And they start bowing down, hail king of the Jews, as they would hail the emperor Caesar, mocking him. This is a joke to the Roman soldiers. And then they take the reed out of the king's hand and they begin to beat him with his own scepter in the head again and again as they strike him mercilessly in the face. And they begin to spit on him, continuing to bow down in false worship and homage. And as we read earlier in Isaiah, just how bad these beatings and this scourging had left Jesus in Isaiah 52, 14, he says he was so battered and marred that he was beyond human resemblance. He didn't even look human anymore. People had to turn their faces from him in Isaiah 53, 3. Again, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, Isaiah 56, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and from spitting. And when the soldiers finally finish their mocking and their deriding and they've had enough, They tear the robe from Jesus' back, that purple robe that they'd put on his back. And the fabric, no doubt at this point, had probably stuck to the blood clots and the serum in his wounds. And so when they rip it off callously, you can imagine the excruciating pain, like a bandage being carelessly removed from a badly opened wound. And then they lead him away, all the way from Pilate's headquarters where he was sentenced and scourged half to death, all along the Via Doloroso, the way of suffering as it's come to be known, to Calvary, 650 yards, forcing him to carry his own cross, at least the crossbar, the patibulum, which was 80 to 110 pounds. And he carried it as far as he could carry it until he couldn't carry it anymore. And so they compelled this passerby, Simon of Cyrene, to pick up his cross and to carry it for him the rest of the way. And they arrived at Calvary. And they lay him down on the cross. And they take his hands, stretch them out, and they hold a seven-inch spike as a Roman soldier cocks the hammer back and drives it straight through his hand and into the cross. And then they take his feet, his ankles, and put them one over another. And they take an even bigger spike and drive it clean through his ankles into the cross. And Jesus is hanging there. This is 9 a.m., on Good Friday. And if you follow the chronology of the Gospels and you harmonize them together, this is what begins to take place in those six hours as Jesus hangs on the cross. At 10 a.m., Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. The soldiers divide up Jesus' clothes The people are continuing to hurl insults and abuse at him, wagging their heads. 
The chief priests join in on the action and they continue mocking him. He saved others. He can't save himself. One of the criminals on either sides of him mocks him. At 11, the other criminal pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you that on this day you shall be with me in paradise. And Jesus looks down at his mother and John the apostle beside her. And he says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And then at noon, Luke 23, 44 says, Darkness covers the whole land for three hours. And at one, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he says, I thirst. And then he says, it is finished at 2 p.m. And he prays, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And at 3, an earthquake hits. And the temple curtain is torn in two. Tombs break open. The centurion exclaims at the foot of the cross, witnessing the manner in which Jesus died and how he willingly gave up his life and breathed his last. He died on his own divine schedule, not from the brutal scourging and the brutal crucifixion. And he says, truly, this man was the son of God. And the crowds witness Jesus' suffering. And they begin, too, to realize the same. And they beat their breasts in repentance. The two soldiers are ordered to break the criminal's legs, and they do. They probably tried to break Jesus' legs, but they couldn't because Old Testament prophecy said he, not a bone in his body would be broken. And so instead, to make sure he's dead, the soldier just pierces his side. John 19, 34, and, and blood and water comes gushing out. And then Jesus is buried. That's what happened during those six hours on the cross. And there's just one part of that that I want to highlight for us this evening as we continue to reflect on the paradox of the cross, which is both a horror and a wonder, which is both ugly and beautiful. which is both the greatest single act of evil committed in human history and yet the greatest act of grace committed by God divinely. As he hung there on the cross and he cries out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to think about that for a second. For the first time in his eternal existence, Jesus is now experiencing forsakenness from the Father, the abandonment of the Father, separation. He can't feel the Father's presence anymore, he can't feel the Father's love anymore. He can't feel that bond which he had felt and existed in eternity as the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And he's in agony because of it. Not just the physical wounds which are enough. It's the spiritual death that's crushing him so much so that he cries out, not even addressing him as Father anymore as he has throughout his entire ministry and life, but he calls him God now. It's like he's not a son anymore. And this is incredible. It's incredible that he does this. Because he does this willingly. He did this willingly. He did this willingly when, when Jesus' cry of dereliction should have been mine. 
Jesus' cry of dereliction should have been yours. It should have been us crying out to God on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not Jesus. He didn't deserve that. I deserve that. And so here's the great mystery of grace in which all of our heavenly hope lies. Because Jesus was forsaken, I am forgiven. Because Jesus was forsaken, I am reconciled. Because the Son of God was abandoned, I who deserve to be abandoned am made a son. If Jesus doesn't suffer the abandonment of his Father, then you and I must suffer it. And the abandonment of God, being forsaken and cut off from God without hope, that's hell. That's hell, being separated from God. But he did suffer it, and because he did suffer it, I live in the freedom of knowing I never will. I never have to, because he did. He suffered it, he paid it all. And anyone who comes to God by faith, and by faith alone, in his substitutionary, saving, atoning death on the cross for their sin, too has this heavenly hope of forgiveness, of reconciliation, and of peace with God. Would you bow your heads with me?